Uh, Major General George A. Reb, R-E-B-H. Well, I was 17 when I went into West Point and graduated in the uh, class of January 43, which was the first war-shortened class. Subsequent classes until 1947 uh, were four-year or three-year classes. I had selected the Corps of Engineers as my branch, so my first uh, station was down at Camp Gordon, Georgia with the 293rd Engineer Combat Battalion. The battalion was in the stages of basic training with the uh, civilians that had just come in. And I was put in charge of uh, the second platoon of B Company. Four uh, months later, I was made uh, commanding officer of the uh, Company A. The first thing I did when I took command, I gathered the men together and I said, we're going to war eventually and my mission as I see it is to bring back as many of you alive and unharmed as possible. So I said you can expect that I'm going to be tough but I tell you I'll be fair and I hope you will cooperate in this effort. After we complete our basic training we were sent out to uh, the California Arizona maneuver area for desert training. We were stationed at Camp Pilot Knob, which is just a little distance from Yuma, Arizona. Uh, that was in September of 43, and then in January of 44, uh, the battalion commander called me to his tent and said, George, he says, your company is being detached from the battalion and uh, you're going to Camp Forest, Tennessee for a special mission. So we boarded the uh, train in Yuma and went to Camp Forest. When he arrived there, I found that we were being one of four units in the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, and I learned that we were to be a deception unit. Now, the four units that we had was uh, a camouflage battalion, which uh, inflated dummy tanks, trucks, airplanes, jeeps. We had a, a signal company from a division which would uh, send out signals through the air uh, to try to deceive the enemy. And then we had a, fourth, uh, a third unit, which was up at Camp Drum, which we called the Sonic Unit. And what they were doing was developing equipment and uh, refining it to send sounds out. They could reproduce the sound of a tank moving, uh, bridge being constructed, uh, assault boats, and I can say later on, having witnessed this, they, by lining up a, a line of uh, half tracks with their loudspeakers, and they had a script by when they would start and stop. In the darkness, 100 yards away, you'd swear that that was a column of tanks moving down the road. Um, and then mine was the uh, engineer combat company, and what our mission was to put provide the security for our units when we were in operation. And also, the uh, bulldozer tracks would scurry up the ground and go over to a place, and that's where they would put a dummy tank and a camouflage net over it to conceal it. Uh, we also did anti-tank and anti-personnel mined uh, surveillance to ensure that they were clear before our people moved in them, and also along roads that we would be traveling, and any kind of construction that was required. Now, the genesis of this concept was uh, by General Devers, who was the commanding general of uh, Europe at the time before Ike took over, and he sent a couple of officers down to El Alamein to see what General Montgomery had done in his successful uh, campaign there against Rommel. And they came back a report, and General Devers decided that what we really needed was a deception unit capable of simulating uh, division and armored division and infantry division. Uh, General Bradley, when he found out about this, said we need a second infantry division. So this was two infantry divisions and a 
Armored Division, which they sent back to the War Department requesting that, which they finally did, and that's why I was at uh, Camp Forest at that time. Now, what it was designed for was the crossing of the Rhine. It was uh, estimated this would be a very difficult uh, campaign because the Rhine constituted the last real barrier to the entry of uh, Germany, and it would be well fortified. Uh, so we did our training at uh, Camp Forest, went to uh, New York City on the uh, 14th of May, boarded ships, troop ships, and went to England, debarking at Bristol uh, Port. And, and I say at that night, the Germans were dropping bombs on uh, the port of Bristol. We traveled to uh, Walton Hall, which was about six miles from Stratford-on-Avon, and it had extensive ground, so we pitched our uh, tents there. This uh, operation was very successful in that the two divisions moved under darkness without their shoulder passing mark up near Vesel and made the attack, whereas the estimates have been there could be thousands of casualties. They cost, and there were only 32 casualties in that crossing. So everybody was happy with that operation. With the end of the war on May the 7th in Europe, we were sent back to the United States to Camp Forest, or Camp uh, Drum, uh, in preparation to go to Japan to do deception work. The uh, war ended in August with the Japanese capitulating. Our unit was deactivated, and my next assignment was with uh, the Manhattan Engineer Project, which had developed the atomic bomb. Uh, general Groves was a commanding general. I was on it from uh, September of 45 until June of 47. And it was secret. So no one, it was secret. No one knew about it. Not only secret, but top secret. Well, after uh, I came back in October of uh, 50, three years, um, I was scheduled to go to the engineer advanced course. Well, when I got back to the, at Belvoir, when I got back, I was informed that that had been canceled and I was to report to the officer chief engineers. And what happened, the uh, chief of staff of the Army, uh, Lawton Collins, had come to the Corps and said, I'm concerned about if the Russians attack in Europe, like the North Koreans attacked in uh, Korea, if they attack in Europe the same way, how can we stop them? Because we had a very paucity of forces in Europe at that time. So he said, I want somebody to start thinking about the tactical use of atomic weapons in Europe. Well, why he came to the Corps was he was looking for somebody who had been in the Manhattan Project. Somehow my name sent us through and he selected me to be that person. So I was given two captains from Sandia Base who had been out there where the weapons were stored so they knew about the weapons. Now, the way this all worked out, I would figure out what I wanted to do, then I'd go to the chief engineer officer where there was a full colonel and a brigadier general how I would brief. And once they'd give me the okay, well then I'd go ahead and work out the details. So what I had decided was to divide the Army, U.S. Army area into three areas, the Folder Gap, Mining and Gap, the Janube Gap. And for each of those areas, have three plans. Now remember, these are plans looking into the future, not fighting uh, the war with the ground, troops on the ground, because I always felt that this was the uh, responsibility of the commanders on site. So for each of those areas, I would add a couple of uh, 
engineer battalions to increase the capability of the way the mines and so forth. And there were three plans. One plan was to look forward or, or take the present line of uh, defense, which was the Rhine River. Next was go all the way to the line of contact with the Russians and do a deliberate defense back to there. And then to look at the ground and find intermediate space where we could put in another uh, final battle position. Now what I would do on each of these trips to Europe, they would give me, USRUR, U.S. Army Europe, would give me a Piper Cub and I would fly over the area with my maps and draw what I thought were good defense lines. Then they'd give me a car with a driver and we'd drive over those areas and do it. So I did it for those three areas and then once uh, we had completed those, SHAPE had come into existence. So then SHAPE asked us to do the British sector and the French sector. Uh, when I briefed on the French uh, sector, the Black Forest area, I'm told there were 21 generals in their French and U.S. listening to this. Then after I got through with the American sector, uh, the gentleman that I'd been briefing, General Ferenbaugh, who was a three-star general, and he was in charge of OPOT operations, planning, training, and organization. He said, Reb, uh, if you were the Russians, how would you attack us? Well, I knew from my study where I would do it. So I said, well, I'd like to see a train map, a road map, uh, the rivers and streams map. And I said, in, in about two hours, I'll tell you. So I went back and reviewed my thinking on this and came up and said, through not the Falda Gap where everybody was expecting the Russians to attack, but through the Meinigan Gap, which lay to the east of the west of them. East of, east of. Well, they asked a group of German generals who had fought against the Russians the same thing. And strangely enough, they came up with the same solution, that Meinigan Gap with the place they would expect the Russians to come through and not Falda Gap. Uh, which had done that. What were the other operations that you were personally involved with besides the Rhine River that you mentioned earlier? Well, we had 20 of them. One was out at Brest. We uh, sent the 6th Armored Division out there, and we portrayed elements of the 6th Armored. Now, one of the things we found that all the Army commanders, Corps, Division, uh, we're not happy with deception because they could see that their troops could be uh, hit, casualties. Uh, some of them were very uh, sympathetic and wanted our use. Well, out at uh, Brest, what happened was with the 6th Armored, 6th Armored Commander gave us a plan whereby we would pretend that we were going to make an, a major attack in this area. So we built that up with our dummy tanks and the sounds and so forth. And what happened, the plans were changed and they sent uh, their main attack through there. Well, when they did that, well, they really got clobbered because the Germans were expecting it because of the dummy operation. Uh, all, uh, another, as I say, we had 20 of them. Another one was when the 7th Army was coming up from uh, Marseille, uh, we went out on that flank and portrayed, uh, I think it was Third Army units on that flank. Uh, in the, uh, at Metz we had an operation. Uh, we had a couple along the uh, Meuse River. Uh, and another one, on it again, commanders not knowing how to utilize deception, uh, we were building the division commander uh, wanted us to build a dummy bridge here so that his troops could attack uh, over here. Well, again, at the last minute, it was changed to cross where we were doing it. 
And of course, they got hammered with artillery because that's where the enemy was uh, expecting us. Would you, would you do your military service again? Oh, those 32 and a half years are just incredible. Um, well, just for example, I went to West Point and we had five year uh, obligatory service. At the end of five years, I could have retired and gone back to Dearborn, Michigan, where most people thought I'd be eventually become the president of Ford Motor Company because I had been all state basketball, president of my class, valedictorian, and presidents of other societies. So I was well known and respected. But after five years in the Army, I just enjoyed the camaraderie. And the only thing I wanted was positions of responsibility and enough uh, money for a decent livelihood for my family. So I found serving the country very desirable at that point. One other thing, uh, after I completed my Rhodes Scholarship, I had a Greek friend who went to GE and offered my services, and I was told I'd be paid $10,000 because of my knowledge with the Manhattan Project. But again, that did not appeal to me at that time because I was very happy in the Army. I wanted to serve. Final judgment was that we were not out there winning the war because what we did in terms of actual movements, but what we were doing were ser uh, saving American lives. And uh, that was considered quite uh, remarkable.